today I am going to be sharing with you about how I automate a lot of my post production. And a lot of this is um, inspired by several, several things. One, I have a very short attention span. I am not like officially diagnosed, but I'm like almost positive I have ADHD. Like just, I cannot, um, I lose focus very easily. I get bored very easily too. I do not like redundant task. I like, I prefer being creative. I like the new shiny object as my husband always says, but anytime something is like repetitive, I'm, I'm checked out. I fall asleep if I ever have to be on the computer for too long, like editing. And frankly, I actually get depressed if I'm, does anyone get that too? Like when the sun starts to set and I realize I'm still on the computer, like I start to get depressed. So knowing that about myself, and especially for those of you who are in my Like Nobody's Business um, coaching program, you know that I always preach about, you have to design your business to fit around you and your personality and your life. Like, don't let your business dictate the kind of life you're going to have, right? So these are like the things that we have control of and how we can make sure that we're happy and that we stay in this business for a, a very long time. So a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon today. Um, what I'm sharing with you today is a lot of like what I realized made me almost quit. Because there were times where I'm like, oh my God, this is not for me. Like maybe I'm not like cut out for this. You know, maybe I should just go back to a stable nine to five, a boring nine to five and not have to deal with the hardships, right? Because I mean, any of you who've been in business long enough, you know that there's ups and downs, right? Couple of the common ups and downs that have made me almost quit. One, unsatisfied clients. Anyone had unsatisfied clients before? Um, the unsatisfied clients I found have always been either because of unmet expectations, because, you know, miscommunication somehow they were expecting one thing I delivered something else. Um, it could be with, with timing, like it took longer than expected. Um, maybe they were expecting more than what, what I gave, you know, somewhere in the communication, they didn't realize that their package didn't include I don't know, whatever other extra stuff or the turnaround time was different than what they expected. So a lot of that comes in the education part. And um, like those of you in like nobody's business, that's what we were just talking about, right? Like the customer journey, the expectations that you set for them. So it's important to have that all set. Now that, that's like what you can do on the front end, but on the back end, there's the stuff that we can do as well, like in the post-production side of things how to be more efficient with our post-production um, so that we can deliver on, on a timely manner, that we can deliver on a consistent manner as well. Because if your portfolio is showing one thing and you're delivering something different, that's where you're gonna set yourself up for customer uh, dissatisfaction as well. So being able to deliver efficiently and consistently is important in, um, in maintaining like a healthy business. And then the last thing is balance, right? Like you, in order to maintain all of this, you wanna make sure that you're also maintaining a healthy work-life balance as well, because you don't wanna burn out. Um, you know, if you're staying up till 2 a.m. to edit the photos and to design the albums and all that, it's just not realistic. Like how, how long can you keep that up? It's not gonna be that long that's what's eventually gonna put you out of business. So that's why these systems and today, I mean, there's so many different components to the business, um, but I think for those of you who are in like nobody's business, this talk kind of times in perfectly as what we're the chapter that we're about to get into. So, but, you know, aside from like the booking process, the marketing process and all that, there's also the post-production side and that's what we're gonna focus on today. How to keep your clients happy with a quick, and smooth post-production process and consistent post-production process while maintaining a good work-life balance that is sustainable 
something that you'll be able to continue to carry on throughout the life of your business and something that won't burn you out. Because, you know, as they say, what doesn't kill you, um, we'll try again, right? So um, it's not good enough to just ignore it and keep moving on. Like you actually have to fix it because if you don't actually solve that problem, it's going to keep coming back and trying to kill you again. So maybe, you know, this busy season almost killed you, but if you don't actually solve those pain points, the next busy moment you have, it's going to try to kill you again. So today we're going to come up with solutions for it, not just getting through it, but actually doing it better and how to build strong foundational blocks. Um, and those of you who are in like nobody's business knows how strongly I talk about this all the time is you have to have good system and structure in place for the business um, and build that around a way that is going to support the life you want to live rather than letting the business decide what kind of life you will get to live, right? Um, and so I have a couple tips for you. If you're looking for more efficient post-production. Okay, so the first thing is culling. After the photo shoot, the most, the number one thing that we have to do is empty out all of our memory cards um, and go through all the photos, right? Um, how many of you can be trigger happy sometimes or like shut, like click, right? You just start to get carried away. I sometimes do that. I have this nervous habit that I had to, um, to nip in the bud and I had to train my second shooters as well is I notice sometimes when we're trying to fill dead air because we don't know what to do, we just keep clicking. Do have any of you guys found yourself doing that? <laughs> like, cause you don't know what to do next with the posing and you're like, um, okay. And you're just clicking while you're thinking, <laughs> like I have to catch myself when I do that because then now I have like 10 extra photos to go through. And if you do that throughout the day, every single time you hit like a, a brain fart, right. That's going to equal to like an extra thousand photos that you're going to have to sort through at the end of the day. So I keep reminding myself, like, I don't want to sort through this. Like it's not worth clicking. Um, I think also because I come from a film background, film is very expensive and it taught me to be more conservative with my clicks. But I find that as soon as you put the digital camera in my hand, I start to just sometimes, if I don't make a conscious effort, I can start to do that nervous clicking. And so with my second shooters, I've had to tell them that too. Like I notice sometimes like, or when you're not happy with the photo, have you had that? Like you're taking the picture and you're just not happy with it. You don't know what to do different yet. And you just keep clicking anyway while you're figuring out what to do differently. So I always have to tell my second shooters, like if you're not, changing anything about it you're actually just recreating the same crappy photo again so change something before you hit that shutter again you know stop slow down and ask yourself like why am i not happy with this photo first and force yourself to change something whether it's a different position different lighting different perspective different pose anything and then you know that will and even if it's not good at least it's something different so don't be afraid to try, right? But at the end of the day, we're still gonna get left with a whole bunch of photos to go through. So I always advise cull like Marie Kondo. Um, how many of you guys, do you know the difference between culling in versus culling out? So let me use the clearing out your closet as an example. Um, anybody had like a closet that needs, that's just become like overstocked with stuff and you need to clear it out? Okay, sometime in our life, we've had that closet, right? Or drawer, yeah, our junk drawer, right? So culling, culling out means let me go through this junk drawer and throw away things I don't need. Can you imagine, like how, how many of you have tried that and just the drawer never gets cleared out? It's hard going through all that versus how many called in, how many of you have dumped the drawer? And this is what Marie Kondo recommends. Like how many of you have just dumped out the drawer, start it with an empty drawer and only bring back what you actually want to keep? Have you, have any of you done that way instead before? That one is actually way more efficient because now you're really just going through what you want to keep. 
Ver and it's less decisions to actually have to make. And I don't know if you realize this, but like the more decisions your brain has to make, the more fatigue you are going to get. Have you experienced that? Like, have you at the end of the day, sometimes when they're like, mom, what should we, what, what are we having for dinner? And you're like, oh my God, I cannot think about dinner right now. Or even your significant other or your friend, right? After a long day of work, when they're like, what do you want for dinner? You're like, oh my God, if I have to make one more decision. <laughs> like, So culling is the same way. It's like, don't underestimate how draining culling can be because that, you know, if you did a wedding and you did 4,000 photos, and if you are doing the culling out method and you are looking at every single photo to decide yes or no, that's 4,000 decisions that your brain just had to make. And that is gonna be very exhausting on your brain. So what I prefer doing is I assume all of it's trash. At the end of the day, I just assume that all of these photos, I'm just dumping out that junk drawer right now. And now I'm gonna go through and only pick the photos I want to keep. And I find that that is a much less overwhelming way to go through the photos. The second tip that I have for you is utilize automation tools. There are actually um, tools nowadays, and I'm gonna share with you my favorite one in today's um, class, but that will already get you 90% of the way there. And so, this tool is called Aftershoot. And if you just use your cell phone right now and um, scan it, it will take you to a link that already includes 10% off. And I know I'm dropping the code on you guys very early in the talk, but trust me, you're gonna want it. <laughs> it is a free trial. So you, you don't even have to pay to try it. But if you decide that you like it and you wanna keep it, then this link, this specific link will already get you 10% off, or you can use Caroline 10 to get the 10% off. But what this is, is essentially, you, um, it's machine learning. It is using AI, using common things of what defines a good picture, bad, and a bad picture, right? Most common thing, um, what is the most common reason that you would throw out a photo? Oh, I see Don trying to talk. Feel free to unmute and chime in if you have no background noise. Out of focus, look, people looking in weird directions. Yes, exactly. Out of focus, blurry. When you are doing portrait sessions, how many times have you had to zoom in and look at everyone's faces and see if their eyes are open or if their faces are in focus, right? For me, having a, and group photos, if it's a wedding and during the family portraits, Right, I will always take several family. I'm usually very conservative with my clicks, but if there is a group picture, I am gonna click, click, click because you never know, someone might be talking, someone might be looking the other direction. And if it's an important group, I need the option to be able to head swap or eyeball swap. So, but I do that to be safe, but at the end of the day, I really don't wanna go through 10 of the exact same photo times how many group photos there are, just zooming in and having to see everyone's faces, right? So I'm gonna share with you how just that alone, this one really helps with. So it takes common things like that, lighting, out of focus, eye contact. It even has like algorithms for like, what's actually like a happy face versus a, like the different expressions. Like, and I was looking at how it chooses some of the photos and it makes a difference of just like the slight turn of the corner of the mouth. So it's cool in that way. Um, so essentially how it works is you load up this app and I've preloaded it just to help save time um, so that you don't have to wait. And it's fast, it's a couple minutes, you know, but a couple minutes of you sitting there in a one hour talk makes a big difference. So you can set already what your preferences are. So for me, this is what my company uses. You can use whatever you wanna use, but one star means it's a selected photo. Four stars means um, it's, a, it's a highlight. I'm gonna, I might wanna use this as a sneak peek. If you've seen my Instagram, like you've seen that the last three weddings, I've been releasing previews very fast, like right after, right? And it's because of this that I'm able to already, like just give me the quick, good photos real quickly. And let me just take a look at those. Duplicates are three stars. So that in case I need to do eyeball swaps, or if I want to look at 
you know, the minute differences to see which one's better. It gives me a three star. Blurred photos are two stars. I have it because sometimes I purposely make blurry photos and I like blurry photos. So, but the algorithm, you know, it's, it's a machine, right? So it's gonna give you what the most common things are. Um, it's like a bell curve, right? It's gonna give you everything that fits it in within that bell curve. But if you like deviate too far out and get too artsy on things, the machine is not gonna be able to detect that. And that's okay. So that's, you know, where I can go through and just find those photos. Um, and then I put closed eyes under the same one because I was saving my stars, I guess. I didn't want to use a five star. I don't know why. I think it's like, I, I'm like the, I'm the type that like, don't like to give the five stars. I like to hold back. And so nothing is, none of my work, it's like a random thing, but none of my work to me is worth five stars. So I can never give a five star to my own work. So the highest thing I can rate myself is a four star. And from there I ran out of stars. So <laughs> There you go. But for you, you can certainly, you know, do the five stars and have an extra star for yourself. But so this is how, you know, I, oh, and get, get this. My 11 year old son actually does this, all of this for me. What I'm sharing with you today, he, I taught him how to do. Um, what, what I didn't get to really touch upon is the importance of having systems. Like I said, if I find myself doing any repeated task, I fall asleep, I get bored, I'm uninspired. And I know that about myself. So if I ever find myself doing anything twice, what I create in my company is called a run book. It's essentially an instruction manual. It's detailed step-by-step -step instructions. It's the, the screenshots that I'm sharing with you. And it needs to be, when I first created this, the idea was it needs to be so dummy proof that I could pick up a high school intern. I could pick up um, a day laborer to come in and just open up this manual. It was also nicknamed the if I was hit by a bus manual. If something, God forbid, happened to me today and I was not able to continue with my business, my husband needs to be able to pick up where I left off and know how to finish the deliverables for my clients. And so we have this manual in, in my company that for example, even shipping things, how to ship, you open up to the page, how to ship, there's pictures, package it like this. So it's, you know, foolproof, right? And if I get, you know, a switch in interns, a switch in assistants, I don't have to retrain them. Here's the manual. Um, so we have a manuals for the post-production as well. And I tested it by one, I had a college intern who wanted to work for me. So I was like, great, your first task is um, I'm going to teach you how I do it. And then you're going to you're going to write down everything I do and take screenshots of everything I did. So that's how the manual was first created. Then I had a second high um, college intern that like a month later that wanted to work for me. Great. Your first task is to take this instruction manual and see if you can follow it and get the job done. So that's how we started the post-production um, process. Everything needs to be um as objective as uh, as possible and not subjective the number one reason why people feel like they can't hire people is because they feel like oh no one can do it the way i did it's like no that means you didn't train them well enough right so essentially what using aftershoot like now instead of trying to train a person what makes a good photo and what makes a bad person a photo person <laughs> what makes a bad photo um i'm training um the the unicorn now. So there's, um, and after shoot, the good thing is because it's a machine, I don't have to worry about staff switchover. So my son uploads all of, or downloads all of my uploads, uploads all of my memory cards at the end of a shoot, uploads it to after shoot. We run it through, um, we set our preferences. I just put everything on strict because to me, that's Marie Kondo, right? It's emptying out that drawer. So assume everything is trash and only bring in what you absolutely think is the best. And, and then I'll go through and see if there's anything that I know that's missing. So I put everything on the strictest part. And then this time I actually wanted to show you um, a real session. So I actually did this on the plane ride home 
from my shoot in San Francisco. So loaded everything up. I have it on a little, um, I put all of the memory cards because we wrote on, we wrote on like several memory cards and I put it on a little, a little um, hard drive. So then now everything is in one place. Then I plug it into my laptop. I drop all of the photos into Aftershoot. I hit run and I went to bed. That was what it looked like after the wedding. Loaded all of everything up, had it run, went to bed. Then the next day I boarded an early flight home because my kids were gonna be in the Memorial Day parade at my city and I needed to make it back in time for the parade. So on the flight home, I went through the photos and I um, just looked at how good the machine is. One thing to note is the machine is not gonna get you there 100% um, ever really, right? Because it can never, there is a certain element of your artistry and that's like that touch that you put in. Like I said, if you're gonna be really artsy fartsy, there's no way like a machine can know, distinguish between intentional blur and accidental blur, right? So the, but it will get you for me, it's like 90% of the way there. And that makes a huge difference. If you can see here, we shot 2,700 photos at the wedding. Um, the machine narrowed it down to about a thousand. So it cut it down by a third at that point. And then I cut it down another bit more after that. Um, what I like about this is there's a lot of shortcuts. It's very intuitive with the fingers, but if you ever forget, there's a quick question mark there and it tells you how to, there's always that quick tutorial of looking for shortcuts. So now let's say it already has this all to me, um, sorted out for me, I double click it and you can see here, the duplicates are here. So to the unicorns, these two are the same photos. So I get to choose which one I think is better. Let's say um, the, the three keys that I use the most is A, S, and X. So I'll tell you how I remember. A means add. So if I look at this and I say, I also want, or means also, right? So Unicorn said, this is the only good photo. This is a duplicate. But if I also like this, then I would click A also, then it would now keep both of it. If I think this is actually better than this, then I would hit S. And to me, S means switch. So switch it, keep this one, don't keep that one. Then it would switch and it would make this one the duplicate. And X means just delete it, this, I, I don't want this. Um, the periods and the comma is left and right within here. And then the left and right arrow is between the keeps here. So that's how, so that I like that it's intuitive with, with the fingers. So I can go through here, you know, and see, okay, let's see. It said these three were all duplicate photos. So I just look at which one is the best one that I like. So let's say I actually prefer this photo. Then I would hit S, switch, go back and hit A. So A turned it into um, an also. So then I kept both. Um, but let's say I want to switch it with this and I hit S and then now I, it switched out the initial one. So, um, and then anything that I like, I would add a four star to it. And I think where it really shines and helps a lot, and you can see it also um, deciphers between the detail shots as well. So you can see, and then it chose, it chooses it based on like, you know, which one's the most in focused and um, compositionally, you know, based on just very science, like which one is the better one, which one is the straighter one, for example. Um, let me take you to group photos because one of my favorite features on this one that I found really helps me get through the culling a lot faster is, um, the family group ones are, are a good one. I think I missed, where did it go? Okay, here. So if you take a look at these family shots here, right? So this is where we are doing a lot of different faces. Now, I love this part right here. It gives you a close-up of every single face that is in that set. 
So I don't have to take the time to zoom in, move my mouse around. So it really keeps everything within the two fingers and that just makes things move so much faster. Like I never have to grab the mouse. So this, I'm able to quickly see the faces. So let's see the other option. I can go back and forth. You know, if both compositions are good, then I'm really just looking at these faces here and see which one has the better faces. You can also look at like the, you know, pay attention to the important people, right? So these are the grandmas, those are their faces. Um, let's go to like big, yeah, group pictures again. So see this one, you can see she's like half blinking. And if you see, it also marked it as a three, right? Um, and then the picture that it did choose, everyone's eyes are open. Um, let's go to another. Yeah, so this one also has duplicates here. So when I'm going through it, like I don't actually look at all the duplicates. So what I'm actually doing, I am typically just calling more out at that point because I'm assuming that the unicorn has already decided what's the best, what are the best photos. So I typically don't scroll through these little duplicates here. The only time I do that is, for example, um, let's say I know that there were some really good variety of expressions. Like, let's say maybe they were, they were laughing. Um, let me see. Like for example, like the first dance, the first dance photos, right? This one has 10, this has 11 duplicates. This is my second shooter's camera. Um, the AI will choose what it thinks it's best, but maybe one is they're not kissing and maybe another one they actually kissed. Like this one, she's whispering something to him. Maybe I actually wanna keep, keep that, right? So then that would give like the, the add options where I want to pull more of these out. That's the only time that I'll actually look through the duplicates to see if there's variations of expressions that I might want to keep. But otherwise, I pretty much just comb through this and see if it has. Um, and most of the time, I find that I'm actually further kicking out, which makes it easy for me because I don't have to go through as many photos. So that's. Um, kind of in a nutshell of the culling process. So my son, my 11 year old son drops it into Aftershoot for me and just gets me to, um, to the automated culling part of it. And then I, and he usually does that like when I'm done with the shoot, um, he'll usually run that before he goes to bed. So it's running while I'm sleeping and it doesn't take that long. You can see 2,700 photos took 21 minutes or just under 22 minutes to run. So that was like the time it took to like go brush my teeth and wash my face and get ready for bed, right? I come back and then it's done. Um, and then once you save the changes, this can actually export directly to Lightroom as well. So let's say, okay, this is the final that I like. I'm currently training the unicorns to know what I like as highlights. And so I'm intentionally choosing all of my four stars in here so it can see and understand me better. The more you use it, the more it starts to understand you better. So the first time you use it, you know, it's, um, you might feel like that's not what a good photo is. That's okay, train it just like an employee. If you're working with an employee, it takes time to train, right? Um, but once you're done, you click export. And then that's where you can decide if you want to export directly to Lightroom or if you want to export a copy. I, I export it actually to a copy. Um, we, I have a folder called edit and that's just the edited raw photos if I ever need to go back to it again. But you could actually just export directly to Lightroom as well. Um, any questions about this so far? I'll, I'll pause right here for, for questions. Anyone ever, anyone tried calling with Aftershoot before? Ooh. Well, I'm excited to introduce this to you guys because this has made my last three weddings. So I shot 
um, three weddings within this last month and they're all delivered like well this except for this one but this one's already on its way um lisa lisa says that she's in the trial period right now and loves it so far susie says i've tried it but didn't have a lot of luck so hoping to get some tips yeah susie would you like to share like um any pain points specifically that i can help you with Keith says, I love it. I've used it in my last three shoots. Um, Amy asks, is it a subscription? Yes. And how much is it? Can I have Christine answer that? Real quick. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, he knows more the, about the subscription stuff. You, you answer that for me. The, um, the monthly price, so if you just want to go month to month, is $14.99. And when you use the code Carolyn Tran, you get, or Carolyn 10, you get 10% off your first month. Or what I would do, since it's 10% off your first purchase, I would sign up for the annual, which is $120 a year. And then um, you get to take 10% off of that, which I think works out to 108. Nice. And, you know, even at $14.99 a month, like if you hire somebody to come in to call for you, that's that's less than their hourly wage, at least in California. You know, I think our minimum so, wage here is 15 or something. I think even the 120 or $108, if, if you had somebody call one or two things, you've paid that amount. Yeah. Which was my logic when I very first signed up for it. I was like, please take all my money. <laughs> yeah. So even if you called just like one or two sessions in the year, it's already the cost of what you, what it would cost to, hire somebody to do that for you. So to me, as a business owner, it's a no brainer because your time is worth so much more than that. You know, that the hours that you would be spending sorting through these photos here. And like I mentioned, I used assistance before, but the issue with using assistance is you have, they there's turnover with them and then you have to retrain them every time. But this one, I train the unicorns once and then they remember it after that. So it's, getting better and better each time I use it. The accuracy is getting, um, is better. And I find that it, it gets you um, like 80 to 90% of the way there. So um, I think I answered, let's see. Sandra asked, do you keep the duplicates only if it's like something that I wanna keep? One thing that I do do um, at the end of it. So let's say that I've gone through everything already and I've taken out all the photos that I don't need. And I've sorted through, like, honestly, like when I look at these, I, I won't even go through the duplicates because that's already good enough for me. Like I look at this and it's fine. Like I don't need to look at the duplicates, right? If I go through like the, um, I don't need to see the duplicate of this one. But actually, if you notice what it classified as duplicate for this specific, notice the, notice this one right here. As I did the flat lay, it, there was a progression. It started as this, then I added the ranunculus, and then I added the ring box to it. Do you see? Like, so after shoot clumped it all as a duplicate together. So then it comes back to me, do I want to keep the variety or was I really building up to this point anyway? And I don't need all the other ones. So after shoot is assuming, you know what, like 80% of the photo was unchanged. So I'm going to assume that it is a duplicate. And so that's up to me if I decide I want to split it up and use, um, keep the ands. <laughs> I'm thinking in letters. I'm like, if whether I want to hit A, <laughs> whether I want to hit A and keep multiple ones, or it's fine keeping it clumped together like that. Um, and this is like what I was saying about culling, culling in versus culling out. I'm not going to waste my time going through the duplicates unless I need to, because that's just more decisions to make at that point. You know, it's, it's why we don't show the clients all our reject photos, right? Because if they had to go sit through all that too and decide whether they want you to edit or not, it's just a waste of time. Like it's trash, just get rid of it. We, you know, between like the two fathers, this is what, unicorn thought was good and I would agree. like the difference is so minute a client's not going to notice 
the difference at this point. So it's not worth my time scrolling through the duplicates to find that because from the moment that I scrolled through there, that was good enough and I'm just gonna keep going. So I basically just kind of do a run through like that and see, is it good enough? Is it good enough? If it's not good enough, then it's either an X or is there a better version of it in the, in the duplicates? Um, and I think this one I may actually, let's see. I think I actually like this one better. So then we'll do an S for switch. And then that switches this to be the, the keep photo instead. But yeah, these ones aren't linked. So I'm not gonna take the time to re to relink them. Let's see, is this one linked? Somewhat link. But you can see this one was a good example because this wedding here was my Italy wedding. Over 6,000 photos. That's a lot of photos I would have had to go through. But while in Italy, and that's why it's on my laptop, I was able to just have it run. We literally, while my, while my husband was driving through Siena back to Florence to catch the flight, I just had my computer on my lap running. And after shoot was running while we were headed to the airport. And we were able to narrow it down to 827. So from 6,200 6, to 827. So even if it doesn't get you 100% of the way there, it's still going to save you so much of that like processing, brain processing power. So, um, okay, so then once you click export, it will take you directly to, um, to Lightroom. So let me open up the current wedding. Um, So this is all what we had there um, imported into Lightroom now. So then now it's just readily available for editing and you can see it maintained all of the star ratings. So what I typically do, cause I don't edit my own photos. I, I have an editor. Um, I do have my own presets and that's how my editor is able to edit consistently with my style. But like I said, I try to minimize my computer time as much as I can. So I can filter this by um, if I want. So this is how I do it for my Instagram. I'll come back to the computer in Lightroom. This catalog is actually created in Dropbox. I go through just the four stars just for my Instagram photos. So as I go through this, um, these are, so there's my black and white filter. I have two black and whites. There's patina, which is like a fan favorite. And there's three levels of patina that you can use. Pure is like a very clean, like these are like all film emulations. And then vibrant is for people who like a little bit more color. So I actually like vibrant plus. And typically that's kind of the extent of my editing. I go through it. Um, I find the best one for this, for this particular environment. And then I do just the four stars and I export just the four stars for my Instagram. And then I send the rest of it to my editor. I send her the Dropbox, the catalog through Dropbox. She edits it, lets me know when it's done. And then we just export it since we have the high res on our end. And she um, does it all remotely. She lives in Arizona, so she's not even here, but we're, as long as you import it with smart previews, I don't know if you guys um, like are familiar with that, but as long as you check smart preview when you import, anybody will have all the data they need to edit for you at that point. So, but yeah, that's kind of just like the rundown of, of my post-production workflow. Okay, but yeah, so, you can scan that and then this code will get you 20% off if you're looking for the, but that's like my post-production combo pack right there. Call, edit, done. Um, Melissa says, we are a boutique volume preschool, wondering how it would do with the suit. It would do amazing for your volume preschool sessions because it will automatically group up the kids into each section. It, it will group it up by poses and kid. So into each grouping, and it will already choose which one is the best for you. 
So in that case, all I would do, I wouldn't go through the duplicates if I were you. I would just go through the, so let's say, um, and assuming that you're doing different enough poses, right? So let's say you have one that's like this and one that's like that, then it would group everything that was like in this together. It would already choose which one is the best one. And then it'll do all of the ones that are like this together. It will choose the best one. So when you're going through it, I would just make sure that all the kids look okay. And if they don't look okay, then go through the, um, the duplicates to see if there's a better option. So you keep at it, it does get, it, it's, learn, it's machine learning, right? It needs to learn you. It needs to understand you and what you are trying to achieve, what you think is good and not good. Um, could it auto detect barcodes? Melissa, can you clarify what you mean by that? Oh, because for your volume. Right. We uh, each kid has a, a barcode before them and then we have to mark them manually go through and mark them. So our software will pick them up. If it could automatically mark them, that would be one part of our workflow that we wouldn't have to do. I would imagine it would treat it as a single photo, right? Like as a unique photo. So treat it as a single photo. And what I would normally recommend doing is just skimming through the loop view and marking them. Um, it doesn't mark them yet. I know this is something that this is not the first time this question has come up and is something that is being investigated. Mm -hmm. I see, like looking at, at loop view just to make sure there are that all the barcodes are selected. Sorry, I said loop view, but I actually meant the grid view. So like the overall, so you could just like click through and um, in the next release, there's a new feature coming out. That's the spray can, much like in Lightroom, where you could just hover over it and it would make it even faster to go through and add them all in. So nice. Get those, get those in there. But yes, it is something that's been asked a lot. Um, and so I know it's something that the developers are working on. Awesome. It's on their list. <laughs> what I really appreciate about Aftershoot is the speed that they're able to, um, work on things. So like if you reach out to customer service and say, I really needed to do this, they're very responsive and quick to develop. As a result, there's lots of patches and new updates released, but that's because that's how fast they're keeping up with the demands and the requests. And I've seen this company um, over the last, what, since August? So August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, nine months. Like the growth that, and they've been able to achieve in just nine months has been very impressive. So I'm um, excited. I think there's, this is gonna go really far because for how far they were able to take the software in just nine months, the growth has been phenomenal. So I think it's only gonna get better. It's gonna learn you better. The more you use it, the more it knows you as well. For those of us who have a habit of inspecting every image and comparing every facet, how do you recommend making the transition to trusting the AI? To me, it's like, Marie Kondo, you know, it's dumping that drawer out and only going back for what you absolutely need and being able to just let go. And I think that confidence comes with time. You know, as you do it more, you will start learning to trust it more. But yes, if you're used to um, micromanaging and nit nitpicking, you know, it's going to be baby steps to take away, right? But eventually you're going to find that, wow, like, I, I have so much more free time now. I also found that during my really busy season when I didn't have time to nitpick, it was great because it didn't give me a choice. And then that was when I realized like, oh, I got by without, without like nitpicking everything. Like I'm, I'm okay. Like I was okay just trusting after shoot to pick it. Um, oh, I, I forgot to mention the only time um, I will go through is... Sometimes like I, I know that I shot something specific and it might be super artsy fartsy. And when I'm done calling at the very end and I might say, what happened to that photo? Then I'll click all and I'll just do a quick swoop, uh, like literally just a quick, just a quick scroll like that, like spot checking. Cause most at this point I've seen all the photos. And I don't stop unless it really stops me. I'm not going to look at one at a time. I'm just looking through and it's like, wait a minute. I didn't see this one. 
right? Then, then I'll go in and look at it. But if it doesn't stop me in my tracks on initial, it wasn't good enough anyway. And if I forgot, like, have you, have you guys ever like, oh, should like go shopping? And you're like, should I buy this? Should I buy this? And then you think, you know what? I'm going to walk away. And if I'm still thinking about it at the end of, you know, when I'm ready to leave, then that means I really want, I'll come back and get it. Have you guys ever done that when you're shopping for stuff? It's the same idea, right? We take a lot of pictures during the day, but at the end of the day, if you forgot about the picture, it probably wasn't that good anyway. So you don't have to look at everything, you know, just um, what were you super excited about? Then come back and, you know, just making sure that that was selected there. But other than that, I found that um, it's very seldom that that's happened and it's only happened for like really out there artsy fartsy kind of stuff that um like if i'm purposely doing some kind of super blur um you know where the couple's purposely blurred out type of thing then it'll think it's a blurred photo but other than that um yeah i've i've only been calling out i've only had to kick out the stuff um to make it more tight which i prefer that way i get the i found that the unicorns make it just tight enough so that i don't have to go through so many photos um but it gives me enough options that i can still look through and um yeah so all right um that kind of covers our hour but if if i if you still have a question i want to make sure it's answered so like do you guys know how to raise hands in zoom if you go to the bottom there's like a menu and you can raise your hand and i think that'd be the quickest way for me to spot you or you could just physically raise your hand too um and i will i will call you out there's multiple screens so i have to scroll and make sure um but and i think at this point you can unmute and just ask your question as well because i'm going to scroll through the chat box right now don yes the or is Lightroom and the only soft editing software that this capture one into? I use Luminar. Don't know if that's going to be in the. You can you can actually just save the images to your hard drive, and um, any software that reads that um, EXIF data of the color code rating, or you can save them just to specific folders. All right. So. I mean, suppose, I mean, I guess I suppose I could save them to a folder and just sit and open them in Canva or something if I yeah. wanted to. So I'll, so, yeah. Ron, yeah. I'll share, I'll share with you what I, what I do. Yeah. So, um, I actually export to a folder first. The reason why I do this is because if I ever needed to, I don't know, reference the raw, like at least all of the kept raws are in one place. So then I'll pick the folder of where I want it saved to, um, so for example, this is already done. That's what you see. So I have a folder called edit and then it already split the highlights and the selected for me. So this right here would be the raws of just my four stars. And then this is everything else. When I import into Lightroom, I tell it to edit, um, to import everything in the edit folder, including the subfolders. So that's how it gets everything here, but it could be, you know, Luminar or whatever other software that you're using um and then it saves it it saves it into this folder i also do this because um my camera takes gigantic photos i think it's like it's over a hundred megs per file and so i eventually delete the raws of the unused photos so that's why i create the edit raws so then i only have to keep those and i can get rid of especially like that wedding with 64 or 6200 photos like i don't need to keep all those raws you know i wait until i deliver it and the clients are happy and i know they're not going to come back asking for more stuff and their album is complete and when i close out the thing then i can delete the raws at that point um i typically do it once a year though because i just i'll sit down once a year and just archive everything like that um, it works for both Mac and Windows. My laptop is a Mac. My desktop is Windows.